Listener Production. Automotive commentator and journalist Greg Rust, and this is Rusty's Garage. In this episode, I'm in Brisbane at the workshop of one of the greatest drag races Australia has ever produced. Victor Bray's countless wins and jaw dropping times aren't just limited to Aussie motor racing history. He's held world records too. The Black 57 Chev is like Victor's trademark. He loves them and has done since he was a young bloke. As you'll hear in this two part chat, he's a car guy who can't help himself. Bray has quite a collection of resto projects on his to-do list. He's brilliant at the burnout and held down some of the longest sponsorships in sport. In recent years, his battle has been away from the quarter mile, tackling an aggressive form of skin cancer head on. Getting back behind the wheel of his 3,000 horsepower top door slammer has been good tonic and the support from fans overwhelming. The health issues may have taken a toll, but he's the same ripper bloke at heart who's proud of the family's farming roots. Well, my grandfather was a rev head. He had Buicks and old Pontiac and, and Harley, so he's a bit of a rev head uh, in his younger days, of course. And uh, he always used to be swapping cars and buying cars. He used to think to himself, you know, my dad used to buy a new car every now and then, but my grandfather seemed to be buying a lot of cars. <laughs> and uh, But, yeah, so and he was always there. He was a jolly fella, you know, real happy-go-lucky. And But uh, what really got me going, my dad was an excellent uh, bush mechanic, mm-hmm. and uh, we repaired all our own. Uh, it wasn't a lot of money floating around in them days, and uh, we repaired a lot of... Uh, um, all, all the equipment on the farm ourselves, we did all the maintenance ourselves, all the repairs ourselves, and, and most of the stuff that we wanted that you couldn't buy or we couldn't afford, we used to make ourselves. So uh, we had welders and a, and a little workshop over there. So that's where I sort of got the idea of, of mechanical stuff. And and then when I was, I think, 10 or years old or something, one of the neighbours wanted to sell a Ford Prefect. Well, I cannot imagine you in a Ford Prefect, <laughs> mate. That was the first one, wasn't it? Yeah, the very first car was a Ford Prefect and uh, I got it home here and I thrashed the living guts out of it. And well, I learned how to drive it first and then... Uh, you know, you know, things like batteries and that in them days didn't mean much to me. We had a tractor that had push started and all the vac was dead. When I got it, it was mint. Oh, I had it nowadays to be worth gold. But, uh, anyway, so I just drove that around and around and around and just drove it around. I was only a young kid and so I um, didn't do really too much hooning in and stuff. But um, then one day it stopped. It started getting a bit of a in the exhaust, you know. <laughs> And then it stopped, you know, it had no power anymore, so I parked it over there and I says, oh, Dad, I need a new car. And uh, he said, what, what do you mean you need a new car? I said, oh, listen to this one, it don't go, it's got no power anymore, nothing, it's just, no, I just need another car. And he goes, well, just fix that one. And I looked at him and I said, what are you talking about? And uh, he said, oh, let's get into it. So we ripped the head off it and uh, a couple of valves were burnt out in it and we repaired the valves, I jumped back in and had power again. I was absolutely amazed that you can get one of these cars, running good, thrash the living ring out of it, right? And then you can fix it up and do it all over again. You know, it was just, it just stunned me. I was, it's, it's something that, you know, like I was a, I was a, a, a farmer, you know, I was a farmer's son and uh, basically we used to get up in the morning real early, go feed the potty calves, little potty calves that we had and then uh, I'd go to school at uh, four minutes to eight, I had to leave for there for the bus and uh, we'd go to school and then I'd come home, when I'd come home, we'd to feed the calves again and then we'd pack tomatoes all night and then I jumped in the truck with my dad and we went and dropped them off at the Rockley Markets nice. and that's pretty much what we did, you know, for, uh, six days a week, so... Um, having a car to thrash around on the Saturday when we weren't working, that was that was pretty cool. You became world famous for doing stuff in a straight line. But back then on the farm, were you Victor Bray, wannabe rally driver? Were you trying to be Alan Moffat? What were you What were you aspiring to do on this, you know, on the farm in the paddock basher? I'll quote my mum and dad, if you like, Victor Bray, idiot. <laughs> right? Um, we used to have, uh, we'd had a lot of, I ended up having, you know, I had a neighbour here, Glenn Hallett, used to live next door to me here, and he, uh, him and me had 52 cars all together. 50? They were all, they were all Holdens too, weren't they? Yeah, FXs? Or- yeah, they were all mainly Holdens. But there was a couple of ones that I don't like talking about. One was a 55 share we bought for 30 bucks. Oh. And it, it was mint. But geez, it lasted a long time, bashing into the trees and stuff, you know. <laughs> bit, bit disgusted about that in myself, but... Um, no, we used to, we had, uh, one of the great things we did have, and I had a lot of FJ Holdens and a lot of EKs and stuff like that. One of the best things we had was the FJ Vonnet turned upside down. We used to tow each other around down the salt marshes in them, and, and you know, you'd flick the thing out the back and 
Look, thinking nowadays, it's you didn't have one of them shows, goofy shows, where someone hurts himself doing something <laughs> stupid on television. But it was good fun. And we used to thrash around those six, you know, grave motors and stuff. But, uh, we had a lot of them, and uh, the reason I know we had 52 because that's what the council uh, told me I had to remove <laughs> <laughs> when we had it. Was his property vax my property, so we lined them all up, and we just had to make them look neater because we had them upside down, jammed into trees, vogged in the flats, and everything. So we actually just had to um, uh, line them up, and make them look a bit neat. So we put them in a big line. There was 52 of them there all together. So some some were varied and half varied, and but uh, yeah, so it was good fun. The, the old paddock thrashing days teach you how to drive, you know, so teach you how to to handle stuff and uh, you know we used to go pretty silly down there but and the worst thing was when we both had one going that was that was ordinary <laughs> <laughs> it's part of history so I, I want to cover it i know in later life now you talk to kids about you know not racing on the streets about you know doing it in the right places you know uh, racing on the track is the is the safest place for it but your history in in proper racing terms really began on the streets, mate, didn't it? Tell us about that and, and how it came about and what you did. Yeah, well, I mean, I used to race on the street an awful lot. One of the things that I do explain before I ever talk to a group of uh, young kids about, because a lot of them say, oh, yeah, well, you know, you raced here, you did this, you did that, you know, because they read my history and stuff on the emails and stuff on, the, on the web pages, um, is that, you know, you have to understand in my day, um, my car was running 17 seconds. Okay, when I was racing on the street. Now, if you got a new car nowadays and uh, from the showroom floor, GDR or something, it doesn't run nine seconds, you take it back for warranty. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, it's a different world nowadays. The cars are super fast. Even the slow cars are super fast. So it's just a different world. And, that, and that's why the street racing thing back then, you weren't running super fast cars. I was running guys in FJ Holdens with two car wheels on it. You know what I mean? Like it was, but nowadays, that's a whole different world. These cars are fast nowadays. Like I jumped in a GDR once there and... You know, the guy showed me how good it went, and it went good, <laughs> believe me. But um, we, didn't so, have, we didn't have the facilities back then either, Victor, that we do now either, did we? No, well, you didn't have, really have a choice. Service Paradise was my closest drag strip back in them days. And look, I ended up going there when I went there and started having fun there. I, that's where I went and did it. I didn't do it on the street anymore. But I got myself in a fair bit of trouble over, you know, organ- I didn't actually organise them, but apparently the police thought I did all the time because <laughs> I thought it was that animal. But uh, one of the things we used to do was right up down the east coast of Australia you know, all the cane farmers a lot of rich cane farmers sons had hot rod cars so we used to cruise up and down one instance was we went to Vunderberg and all my Vunderberg mates I love this and um, and uh, we pulled in the main street and uh, there was all hoons there because we knew that the centre parking in the main street and there was just hot rod cars hoons everywhere you know so uh, we pulled in the main street I had an old grey 57 Chevy and I was there with Brad Park and my mate's uh, nice looking white Camaro and of course they wanted to look race the Camaro because my old crappy Ford, my old crappy Chevy wouldn't have been any good <laughs> he didn't race he said I'm not racing so one of the guys said to me uh, do you race and I said oh yeah I, I race you know no problem at all and and uh, he goes, oh, do you want to race for money? And I, and I said, you know, a bit of a hustle. I said, no, nah, I don't really race for money and nothing like that, you know. And anyway, they started picking on me a little bit, you know, because I was really singlet, big fat tag, you know, like hair over him. And uh, old grey Chevy, it looks like it wouldn't even, you know, lucky to start. Anyway, it's, um, we, uh, you know, it's in this, uh, one guy said, come up, spat up, and he says, oh, well, we don't race. We only race for money, Randy, and mate. So make it 50 bucks. And I said, make it 500. You get yourself a drag race, buddy. Anyway, these all, they quietened the boys down a little bit there. Then there was, must have been a guy in town called Lenny Miller. He was a bit of a hot rider and he had this beautiful GD Falcon. And man, it, it was fast. I didn't realise that there was something that fast in town. But uh, they had a lot of fast cars. Anyway, so they said, uh, uh, okay, okay, let get Lenny Miller, get Lenny Miller, you know. So they must have gone and rang him up and he must have brought his GD Falcon out. And, and uh, then they said, oh, okay, follow us to Goodwood Road. And remember all that clearly. Mm-hmm. So I went to Goodwood Road. I, I took Ven out of the – he was in a bassinet in the back of the car. Some. Yeah, yeah. So I took him out and put him on the side of the road and took my two daughters out and um, – and just just wait here, for, you know, Dad's busy. And uh, so I went out there, and these guys, they've obviously done a fair bit of it because they all went and lined up with their lights facing down the track on both sides of the track, and there was a herd of them, you know. There was been 30 to 40 cars there. It's like a movie scene, mate. Yeah, yeah, it was. And uh, went out there. Anyway, the first run, I won the first run, but, boy, this Lenny Miller, he was right there with me, and it hadn't happened. My car ran 11-2 on street tyres through the mufflers oh. in them days, and this guy was right there, you know, and... Um, I thought, wow, so it was then we went back to the start line, Vestia out of three, so 
I go to the next one anyway. He nipped me by about half a mud guard on the second one. I thought, God, this guy's fast. So I turned the other night, this kid on, and went out and beat him on the third one. And, and that was it, you know. We got, got to make some good friends that night. And then the, so we, me and Brad, we go back to a motel room for the night, too late to drive home. So, And uh, we get, get back there in the morning at 6 o'clock. I hear this <laughs> outside the front door. Lenny Miller had gone home, dropped his pipes, put these great big tyres on the back. I wanted, wanted to rematch. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, they were, they were a great bunch of guys up there. You know, I'm still friends with them today. And um, Lenny Miller was did have a fast car. He was a, was a he was a quieter guy than what I would have expected to have a car like that. But there was some real, uh, real, real rough fellas up there, and uh, and it was good fun. And like I say, still friends with them today. Your answer there lends us to the '57 Chef, mate. You and '57s. I mean, fans of the sport really can't imagine one without the other in, in so many ways. Correct me if I'm wrong here, you brought your first, your first one in the late 70s. Is it the first black car you raced as well and, and you still have it today, is that right? Oh, yeah, still got it, still drive it around quite quite regularly, you know. it's uh, I bought it off a guy called Wayne Varva and I've paid $600 for it. He keeps he keeps saying he'll buy it back for 600 <laughs> But um, $600, right, and I left, he lived at Varden. I went over there and I was just amazed and I jumped in the car and I drove home. I got to the very first corner and the front wheel fell off it. Right, so I walked down to Varva's and I said, uh, Wayne, I said, because they call him Mr. Chevy. He owns a business called Chev, Chev City. And uh, he's still still around today selling Chevs. And he uh, he just said, sorry, mate, there's just no warranty on that car, I'm afraid. <laughs> That's how I met Wayne. And that, but it was, uh, I actually had some Monaros. I had, uh, I think I had altogether seven HK and HGHT Monaros, mm-hmm. all V8s prior to that and uh, the very first car I ever had after on the street was an EJ wagon my dad bought for me and then after I thrust that pretty good um, my grandfather who who was having a he wasn't well uh, one year and um, there was a lot of rain around and his pumpkin fun- patch had got out of, out of whack and I was you know a young bloke full of fish and vinegar and he said look he said it, he said if you look after the, the pumpkin patch I'll um Oh, they go your house in the profits. So I thought to myself, oh, that sounds all right. You know, not going to be much money in it, but he is my granddad and love him. So I'll, uh, I'll go and do it. So I chipped them all and turned the vines back and done everything and scuffled up the middle and did all the stuff for them. And uh, anyway, you wouldn't believe it. Because of all the rain, it was an absolute record price for pumpkins. And I ended up with nearly $6,000 in them days was gold. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I was. I was still only 17 or something, 18 then, so I shot down the road and bought myself a brand new Sandman Fennel van. Man, <laughs> and had that for a while. And um, uh, during the warranty, I hope GM isn't listening, but in the warranty, I used to like flat changing the gearbox, and they did. Uh, the gearbox was underpowered for the motors. Had a, had a V8 in it, and uh, I still got some of the cluster gears today, but I had uh, seven warranty claims for gearboxes and that thing over the next 12 months. Wow. So it was, uh, it was a bit of fun. And then I sold that and bought a Renault once more power. Uh, seen this beautiful red HK Monaro for sale in the car yard, so I done a deal with him. Uh, much to my dad's un- unhappiness, he thought I should have uh, kept the car that was worth a lot of money. And got the got the car, let the red it was a beautiful car, like black and tear red HK three eight seven it was. Drove it around for ages, and then I just had a series of HK Monaros after that. Just loved them, and uh, one of the issues with them, I got uh, I got charged. When I pulled over one day and I got charged because I you know I used to. We we're falling apart, putting them together, and all sorts of stuff. I got got charged. I got a ticket one. I still got it around here somewhere. I got charged with having um, three different exhausts on the car. So I had <laughs> yeah, haven't got the best part. Yeah, I got three different exhausts. I had I put extractors on it with a short five on the back. It still had the original five on there, and then I had another set of twin pipes that I tried to put on there on one side, right? So I got charged with having three different exhausts on the car, none working. <laughs> So it was a. Uh, I've still got that ticket. I like that. One. I've got a couple of good tickets over the years. We'll get into shortly. But um, it's uh, but yeah. The Venaros were great. I loved them. And then uh, then I bought the Chevy. I actually bought a uh, first Chevy. I bought was a 1962 two door Impala SS. And uh, unluckily, uh, I had a head on collision in it. Yeah. And um, me and um, you had Marie and, and one of the kids in the car yeah, too. Didn't you? Kelly was it? Yeah, Kelly was in the car. I had Marie in the car. She got. She got her feet trapped between the wheel and the dashboard, and she was she wasn't good. And um, for some reason, I don't know why, the grace of God, I suppose, um, about five kilometres before that, I pulled up on the side of the road. Kelly was on the back seat sleeping, and I got I pulled up on the side of the road. Just I don't even know why, and I put Kelly between two pillows on the back floor behind my seat, and a pillow each side of her, and she was completely unscathed, not touched. Like it was a head-on collision. We we're both doing hundred k. Uh, the other two were two police officers that were off duty that were 
And um, yeah, and he just come over, drifted over my side of the road, and crashed into me. He actually, he was coming over so far, I turned back to the right to get away from him, and then he hit a guard face, woke up, and turned straight into me. So um, it was a it was a very serious accident, and um, we were both lucky to get out of it. And uh, like no seatbelts, seven days, you know, we didn't have seatbelts on. And uh, yeah, it was a bad deal, all that. But um, and then actually, while that car was down, they got towed after no, a month or so later when we got out of hospital and. And I went down there to see what the car was like and that, or pick it up or something like that. And uh, I'm sitting in the in the car, like opening the door, looking at it. It was just sitting in a, in a garage tow joint on the side of the road at um, down there at uh, Warren Bay somewhere. And um, Chick Henry drove fast, and Chick Henry's the guy that started the summer nuts. Yeah. And he's a real chev freak, and he drove fast in a, in his Chevy. Anyway, he saw me there, so he pulled up and come. We had a chat, right? And all that's how I met Chick Henry. You know, so it was crazy. Like just that he'd come fast at that sort of time when I was just happy sitting in the car there. So uh, yeah, so then after I bought the Chevy, then you know, I needed a car. So and I really loved the '57. First time I ever seen a '57 Chev was at a guy called Russell Peters' place. He lives not too far from here, and uh, I went up there. And uh, he said, oh, look, I got the Chevy for sale. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'm looking for a Chevy. And I went up there, and it was a bit of a misty, rainy night, and he had a tarp over, and I walked out his backyard. I picked the tarp up, or he picked the tarp up, and I saw the rear fin of the car, all the chrome and everything on it. That. And uh, I looked at it, and I just, I said, oh, put it down. I don't, I don't something like that. I put the thing down, just wasn't impressed, you know. And I got halfway home, and I thought, that bloody chrome looked all right, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, uh, so it kind of wasn't love at first sight. It wasn't then, love at first sight, no. And then I sort of, because it had a, the Valair thing on the side, so I thought, mm, I might go back and have a look at that one day. Anyway, the Wayne Varva had one for sale, a lot cheaper, so I, I went and had a look at that one and um, and I bought it. So that was a six-cylinder, it was beige in colour, and I drove it around just for a big fat set of wheels on it and drove it around the six-cylinder for ages and then slowly put the motor in. Because I was, I was earning 80 bucks a week at the moment at that time, you know, wasn't it? It was a different time to, like, these sort yeah. of days. And uh, and uh, I would never have got anywhere if it wasn't for Peter Smith and Dennis at DP Auto Parts. Mm-hmm. Uh, they allowed me to give them all my wages every week, and uh, in return I could take whatever I needed to hop my cars up. So um, it, was a, it was a good time. And, you know, obviously, as the story goes, I met Mick Atherwood, and uh, Mick sort of turned me from a hoon because I was a hoon in them days a bad hoon into a drag racer so and uh, took me to you know I was racing but at this track and that but Mick sort of taught me that you know you're pretty good at this you idiot why don't you try and do it properly so and, and that's sort of how the drag racing story but with the street racing stuff um it just sort of happened at the time, you know, like it was just how it was at the time. We'd go out there, there'd be 50 cars out there racing and, uh, and you know, then all these guys would come from out of town and that and like, we'd travel and do it. It was just something that happened at the time but it's uh, there's no way it could happen nowadays. You, know? you have all your cars confiscated and all the, all the police holding yards would be full of all your race cars. Yeah. I want to just finish up on that first car if, if we can before we move on to more of your, your racing career stuff. Um People would be interested in the in the authenticity of it and how you've kept it. I heard stories. Did you did you paint it with black house paint at one point or something? Is that true? I bought I bought um, <coughs> well, it used to be undercoat grey with that black flick through it. I used to love this movie called Two Lane Blacktop. Oh yes, and um, used to love the colour of that fifty five Chevy. And on a side note, I'm halfway through building an exact replica of that car right now. It's in New Zealand at, at uh, Terry's Distant Chassis because he has all the documentation on how what sort of front end and rear end everything had in of it. Of the movie car. Of the movie car, yeah. We are building. It's an exact replica, right down to part numbers. So I got this. I got the Muncie here. I got a lot of stuff. I've been I'm sourcing that for over the last ten years. It's going to be if I get round to finishing it in my time, it'll it'll be a, a guy's car. It's exactly a replica. I couldn't see myself driving a replica that was fake. It's, this is a replica that's real. But anyway, so I love the old grey. Flick the old grey cars was flicked through, and they used to take down service paradise and race. I was having a lot of trouble, you know. Night as well, all shoved through the springs in the back seat, and the, and the line coming over the hill. And and a good friend of mine nowadays um, used to used to be the, uh, the the scrutineer down there. We had a lot of run-ins then, in fact, then. But um, he, uh, he they made a rule that the car had to be one colour. Uh-huh. Okay, you know, it was based pretty much aimed at me. This is a service paradise, and pretty much aimed at me. So. And I went home that night and I got some old crap paint from somewhere. I don't, know, I don't even know what it was, to tell you the truth. I said, oh, let's just paint it flat black, you know, because there was a, a guy called Speedy and he had a Dodge and he used to roll around the streets around here and he used to be painting American flags. And I used to think, it's a bit flamboyant for me, something like that, you know. And then one day he just turned up and it's, it's flat black. 
And I thought, God, now that's a car. That's a good looking car. I love it. Yeah. So, uh, and Oz Feedy was a, it was sort of an icon in the area back in the day. And um, yeah, so I just got this, found this paint. And I, I, I don't know, it was house paint. I think it might have been undercarriage paint for GM. And it was something like that. I don't even remember what it was, to tell you the truth. And it was, um, so I painted the car flat black and I logged it down the next day. I've right? got a clip under the ear from it <laughs> for, for being a smart ass, I reckon. They said, look, this is worse than what it was. And I said, oh, well, you said it had to be one colour. Well, it's one colour. <laughs> and it just stuck with me. I just liked the colour of the car. I found some nicer stuff and... And Dick Langner, who was my painter at the time, um, we bought a 44-gallon drum of it, and uh, that's it. I had to get to wet, go through the drum before I could get some more. So it was, uh, yeah, that's where the flat black came from, for sure. The cars of your career would always, you know, as you, as the professionalism of it kicked in, would always be immaculately presented. But I love the fact that the that trademark flat black always remained, mate, didn't it? Yeah, well, Castro always wanted us to do a uh, flat black car. We did a back to the back, uh, blast from the fast car, if you remember. And uh, ran it at a couple of events, and then uh, even when uh, Gulf Western come along, they wanted me to keep my car flat black. So uh, yeah, it's good that the, the big companies like that do recognise something that you would think would only be in the minds of real fans, you know. Yeah. Necessity, mate, is the mother of invention. So you said before about the lessons you learnt on the farm, from welding to you know fixing farm machinery and equipment. Tell me the story and <laughs> and, and um, of an early car. Uh, did you not find a, a one-tonner chassis at a swap meet somewhere and, and you sort of moulded bodies to chassis and all sorts of things? Yeah, I still got that car too, by the way. I got every car I've ever I got every car I've ever ever raced, at least and most of the cars I've ever had, and all my mates uh, they vagged the hell out of me all the time, telling me I've still got my lunch money wrapped up. <laughs> Wrap, from grade one, wrapped up in the corner of my hanky somewhere. I, I hear you buy, but you don't often sell. <laughs> yeah, that's right? pretty much how it is. <laughs> so I was up at the tournament swap meet, and I come across um, uh, the panels for a '57 Chevy two door, mm-hmm. and it was a two side panels and the roof. And I thought myself, someone to cut it up to import it or something cheap, you know. And I just thought, I could probably build a car out of that. So I grabbed it. It was cheap, 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 you know, at the time. And I bought it back here. Then we, did, we needed a chassis. Well, I was a good friend with Rex up at the of our Wreckers. So I went up there and I said, I need a chassis to put it on a race car. And, and uh, my welder at the time, my fabricator, was a guy called Jerry Gale. And um, took Jerry up there and that. And he said, well, you know, you're not going to mess with this. You're not going to mess with that. But, you know, if you get a decent hold in one tonne chassis, that's going to be something you can really, you know, it's going to be strong. You can vase the ring on so I got a hold in one tonne chassis and I already had a mould for the front. So I had the two doors and and uh, one of the one of the panels on the on the 57 Chev, the VAC left-hand panel was no good. And uh, I made it on Dick Langley, who I said before was my painter, who's also my panel leader and he's a customiser nowadays. And uh, he got a sheet, he cut the whole panel off, got a, sh- a flat sheet of um, of uh, tin, of, of metal and Tack welded it to the side back of my car and just sat there with a hammer and dolly and a, and a pair of tin snips and he made a rear rear 57 Chev vac mudguard on the car. It was just amazing, yeah, the talent that the guy had. Still got it today. He just he builds GT Falcons nowadays, re- okay. restores them. And, uh, yeah, just made this mudguard. And there's a few little uh, idiosyncrasies, you know, that aren't exactly... 57 Chev that Dick Quinn like the way he rolled some stuff and, and this and a little dinty and stuff like that that um, uh, have been in every because we took a mould of that car yeah. and every 57 Chev ever had has had that exact things on the back of it yeah it's crazy because old Dick was just such a talented guy and to turn a flat sheet of steel into a 57 Chev guard in less than two hours was just amazed me right? amazing I want to move to Wild Bunch as the name suggests kind of wild cars wild characters coming together to race that really was the inspiration for for top door slammer the the class or category we now know how important was that period of your career and and for the sports for that matter and your fondest memories of it mate just recall some of that for us well we were going to uh you know we're going there was a Healy really bunch of us, you know, they were racing in um, double V gas and uh, and all sorts of classes, you know, the Gats and all that in Sydney and, and everything. And there was a lot of cars that everyone loved them, you know, the supercharged door slams were doing big burnouts and they had lots of hair in them days, you know, lo- not much nowadays, but lots of hair in them days and they were loud and, and uh, the variety of cars were just unreal, you know, like there was just so many different varieties. Casso in his, in his customised me and his Chevy and, you know, late model cars and Falcon Utes and, you know, there's so many. And uh, we just had this idea, why don't we all get together one day and have a state origin so we had a state origin and uh, it was you know new south wales versus queensland anyway while we're sitting around having a 
the state of origin, you know, us versus them, you know, we're all sitting around thinking to ourselves, why don't we just stick together and go racing mm. out and down the coast? Mm. You know, we got, you know, Gladstone was, was strong in them days and Townsville was strong in them days and Sydney and Melbourne. And we thought, yeah, let's, this, and even uh, over in, uh, in, in Adelaide. And, uh, you know, that's where uh, John O'Kearney first, that's where, the, that's where I first heard a uh, supercharged automatic door slam, a rumping, you know, so that was it. He started the craze and we all had to have one then, you know. But uh, it was good and, and everyone got together and um, we just decided to do it. So whoever was available, we just would look into Gladstone, look into Townsville, look into Mackay and uh, look into to, uh, 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 Surface Paradise or Willow Bank, I think it was at the time. And uh, it just grew and grew and grew and grew and it was very, very good. And obviously everybody wanted to win everything and uh, so – even though we we're still getting good crowds and that, um, you know, some people like let's uh, David Vaxer, for example. You know, I'm running a small block Chevy, and David Vaxer turns out with the Keith Black. You know, hang on, Dave, <laughs> what's going on here, mate? And uh, yeah, Graham Witters from out at Dolby turns out with the Keith Black. And I'm um, thinking to myself, you know, this ain't too fair here. So we had to get some rules together, you know, and yeah. the rules were never going to happen in, in Wild Bunch because it was a, it was like our slam fest. It was a display. It was a, it's like Graham Cowan's, uh, you know, Outlaw Nitro Funny Cars. It's, it's there as a, it's not a competition. Yeah. It's the, it's, it looks like a competition, but it's actually there as a, it's a, it's, it's a, a en- entertainment. It's a show. Yeah. It's a show for the fans. And uh, that went on for years and years of Wild Bunch. So we started, we, we had some great times there too. Uh, and it just it it sort of morphed into door slam, and then one day, you know, nineteen ninety four, nineteen ninety three, ninety four, we had some meetings in Sydney. Nineteen ninety five, we consolidated the rules, and the first door slam around was in nineteen ninety six. Luckily, I won it, and uh, by this time, Zaff had turned up over here, you know. So now we've got this mad rivalry, <laughs> mad bloody. West Australian guy coming over here and <laughs> driving like an absolute friggin' lunatic. But, uh, you know, we can see nowadays how good he actually is. So, uh, but yeah, so some of the good times there was, I think, you know, this, the one we had at Service Paradise uh, at, at um, Calder Park, I should say, uh, when Zach went out on the grass, that was something like that. Stuff like that was just real, really good, really friendship, a lot of good friendship, a lot of good Wild Vats races in Sydney, you know, mm. and... Uh, and uh, yeah, up and down the coast, especially up in Townsville and Mackay and Gladstone. Yeah, when we did a northern tour, that was good because all the guys, you know, trouble is them days. I mean, nowadays I like sleeping in hotel rooms. Them days I was having to sleep under the truck, <laughs> and I did plenty of times. You know, Maria'd sleep in the car, and I'd sleep under the truck. And then we started getting the hotel. Things just started getting more professional as times went on. You know, and but uh, you know, I still remember the times when you know it was just to get on the piss at night, and 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 you know, you really. By eleven o'clock at night at twelve o'clock, and you go, "Oh shit, we need somewhere to stay." <laughs> you know, like the old brain wasn't in gear. So, but yeah, we we're getting great crowds in them days, and the fans were fantastic. Our merchandise sales were terrific, and uh, all the promoters loved us turning up there. And there was a lot of good time. You know, all I have to say, a lot of the best times I had was racing Casso, uh, Alan Vowgen and his custom line. You know, the Chevy in one lane and a uh, and a Ford in the other lane, both in the fifty mid fifties. Oh yeah, it was great stuff. And and he's uh, he used to do these monstrous burnouts. You know, and I used to do them next to him, and it was just good fun. The cars were of a way that, like today, the cars are highly stressed engines, you know, making three and four thousand horsepower. Them days, the engines were, um, they'd run all day. You know what I mean? You know, they, someone had radio, well, I had radiator in mine. Most guys had radiators in them still to keep them cool. So you're driving, you do your vent, you're driving back to the pits. And it was nothing. That's just how everybody was. These are the cars that we'd been racing for years in, in other classes. So they were heavy old things and they didn't go too fast. You know, I think they, you know, Les Winter, I think he was the first one to break into a six, you know, something like that. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was it was just an interesting time and, and a very entertaining time, and it was just a very good fun time. You know, the door slam and nowadays turned into a fierce competition. You know what I mean? And that's where we wanted. And I used to say to myself in them days, uh, you know, after I got it all going, and you know, I sort of sort of instigate. A lot of people were there when we sort of t- turned Wild Bunch into door slam, but uh, it was a very very strong fashion of mine. And, um, you know, after nowadays, I sort of think they just be careful what you wish for but because uh, it's tough out there. I reckon that was – was that a saying of your your dad's or your grandfather's be careful what you wish for? Because in a strange way, mate, you, you were a bit of a victim of your own creation in that sense. You, you passionately immersed yourself in this thing fr- from, you know, wanting to see it succeed mm. and succeed it did but, but – 
also for others, didn't they? Yeah, it did. I, well, my grandfather and my dad always had sayings. I mean, we were farmers, you know what I mean? They were, they were drawn to dust farmers, and so were my uncles. And, uh, you know, they had all these sayings and things all the time. I thought it was normal. When I went to Gatton College when I was 15 years old, I would have been the most naive guy there, you know, because all I'd done my whole life was go to school and uh, only listen to what I wanted to listen to, you know, like I like maths, I like English, that sort of stuff, and some of the stuff I didn't know. French, what are we doing French for, you know? <laughs> no, one at my, no one on my farm speaks French, so, you know, none of the cows freak French. But, you know, so I was just uh, used to work on the farm solid all the time, so I, I didn't really know what was going on when I, when I went to, the, to, to Gatton. And then so I, I basically had to learn from learn sort of social life from there on, you know what I mean? And li- living at Gatton College, with two, I was living up there, Vorder. So living with 2,000 other guys, you learn pretty quick what's going on around the place, you know, and then getting out of there and get, getting into the cars and stuff like that, you know, it was just my first DJ wagon. I wish I could find it now, but I think the way I left it, it probably wouldn't be too good at Nick anywhere. But, uh, you know, I just like, you just like your first car. And the old prefect I had, out, we parked it down the back one day and she went up through a fire, went through it. So I lost that one, you know. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, you just look back on a lot of things, the way things, a lot of things happen. Yeah, I think I, my grandfather and my father, they had a lot of sayings. And, and, you know, it was just the way it was. It was just a farm. I was a farm boy, genuine farm boy, you know, loved the farm. Didn't know there was anything different. Didn't know that. Didn't know anything. You must have been at the same time, mate, enormously proud because you know it, 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 when it transitioned to that professional period that you're talking about. I mean, you're talking uh, twenty cars, I think, phenomenal racing. Uh, I mean, it was it was a great patch for the sport, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It still is, and it could be a lot better too. You know, the sport's a little bit fragmented at the moment. I think. What does it need in your opinion? Then? Uh, it needs unification. There's no doubt about that, and we need uh, we need a solid track. I think there's opportunities with Tal and Vend and the and the family that owns Tal and Vend down there to uh, to get a good track. And you know, well, there's a good track there now, but we don't seem to use it very often. It needs some upgrades, and and uh, that house at the end comes up real fast nowadays. <laughs> years years ago, when you're running 200, 180, 200 mile an hour down there, you know, you could stop and you'd see the house down. There's a house right at the end of the track. You see the you see the house. You think, gee, I hope I hope, I hope my parachute's work every time. <laughs> nowadays, going through the top end at 250 mile an hour is crazy. You know, it's just. It's just really bad. So they've dropped the back to a thousand foot, and I think that's what we need. We need the race tracks. Oh, and Alice Springs, the track at Alice Springs. There's a track out at Alice Springs because of the stability of the ground out there. It's like racing on glass. Like it's just so flat, and they that when they get the traction. You know, if you've been there for the second day, the traction comes good, and the braking area. You reckon you can knock it in neutral and roll to a stop? You know what I mean? Like it's just a great place, and it's all just getting the people there. You know to to race. So yeah, you know, we we certainly have the tracks and the ability for the tracks to get better over the next year or two. Uh, more of them, I'm sort of saying, they can't get much better. Some of them are fantastic now. At, uh, and then we just need unification in, in the management of the sport somehow. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, those sides are so passionate about retaining what they got that I don't know, you know. And as far as the races go, we don't care who, who sanctions the racetrack. We just want all the racetracks running yes. and we'll just go to all the racetracks, you know. And if some IHRA sanction one, if Andrew sanctions some, so be it. You know, we'll, have, we'll hold two licences, we'll go to two cents. Everyone's of the same mind. There's no one that doesn't think that. Everybody in all the competitors think, well, looks like you guys aren't going to ever get your act together and join up again. So we'll just race under both sanctions and happy to do so. Top Door Slammer is a professional class of Australian drag racing. It caters to full-bodied racing sedans which are replicas of Australian or US production vehicles with supercharged V8 engines which are fueled by methanol. I want you, if you can, to put our listeners as close as possible into your driver's seat. So you talked whatever it was before, three to three and a half thousand horsepower. There is a competitor beside you that you're endeavouring to beat. There is reaction time to think about and there is this constant quest to beat the clock mate isn't there just describe what it's like and what you go through for that five to six seconds yeah, it was, it's changed a lot over the years you know once upon a time um you know all the cars were variably different some people had much better tune-ups than other guys and uh nowadays it's still a little bit that way but nowadays you can buy pretty much all the real good stuff and a lot of the teams in australia they rely on american uh, american tuners coming out here to, to help them and so the, it's really closed up a lot in that area so the reaction time which is 
<coughs> sever it to the ET, mm-hmm. and when the green light comes on, you can sit there for five minutes and then still run the same ET, mm-hmm. or you can be right on the wall and hit that second light that starts the timers within 0.0001 of a second. Some people do 0000. So, you know, it's um, the reaction times become very important because – even though some guy might be running a 560 and you're only running a 570, you can gain that on the tree. Easy, easy, easy. So um, so when you get in the cars, so the first thing is they've changed a lot over the years. I'm very fortunate, as guys like Gary Phillips and a lot of people are, we started with 15 and 16 second cars and went 16, 15, 13, 12, 10, you know. We always said when we got, it'll never go any faster. Well, now we're down to mid fives and door slammers. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And uh, <coughs> I can see a couple of cars that are going to run 540 shortly, which is... That's nuts, mate. It's nuts. It's weird. Well, a guy in, uh, I think, uh, uh, Mauler down Sydney the other day ran 273 mile an hour in a door slammer, you know. That's fast. And he didn't do it once or twice. He did it all day. Yeah, he did it all day. So yeah, that's they they're fast. That's a that's a twin turbo car. And that's another story, turbos versus blowers. That's a whole different ball game at the moment. Yeah, so it's really got um got down to the fact now where you you know, I I was fortunate that I started slow and I got used to the cars as they went. And yeah, you know, a lot these guys that jump in these cars, five fifty, five sixty cars and haven't driven anything that fast before, <laughs> I take my hat off to them, mate. Because it's gotta be daunting mm. to say the least you know and uh, I got a bit of a taste of it the other day when I had uh, my health issue and I was out of the car for a year and a half when I jumped back in the car and I did my first run at Willowbank it was only a 6.30 or something like that I got down the other end and I just said freaking hell that was fucking fast <laughs> Bloody hell, you know, and I got back and I thought, then I got to the other end, I thought, that must have been fast. I got down the other end, it was a 6.30, you know. And, what, what happened yeah, when you looked at the time? Yeah, right? yeah, and I thought to myself, geez, you know, that, that, that take, this is going to take some getting used to. And it still is, you know, it went 5.80 the other day, and, uh, you know, and that feels fast. So I've got to re- retrain. You know, when you're in there every second week or every third week, you know, you don't really feel it, you know what I mean? That, took, that situational training is the best thing for you, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I took Wayne Gardner for a run at, at Western Sydney once when, on the old at Eastern Creek, mm. and uh, he got at the other end of the racetrack and he said, how the hell do you know what's going on out there? You know, and he says, I couldn't see anything for the first half of the racetrack, you know. well, And I sort of thought to myself, oh, yeah, I was afraid, you know, I don't really want to jump on a motorbike either and let it <laughs> sideways around a corner. But... Um, it's, uh, yeah, you know, when you've been doing it a long time, you can sort of, it, it just feels normal, you know what I mean? Your brain must just get used to working with it, you know? So so you get in the car and you're sitting in the stage and lanes, you work the tune out, you're hoping that you've got something pretty right, you know, you sort of laid it out. A lot of stuff we've got nowadays assists us, computer technology, you know, uh, programs that let us know how much oxygen's in the air, um, devices that tell us how much traction there is on the racetrack, um, a lot of that sort of stuff. And, and we can really alter anything to do with the timing of the car now and the fuel we've got complete control you can have any timing anywhere on any cylinder and any fuel anywhere along the track so a lot of that stuff is in there we're not supposed to be having electronic assistance so all that stuff has to be preset you can't have anything that's reactive on the run Mm -hmm. and i hope they keep it that way or else it'll just turn into a, a bunch of um experts sitting on the side of the racetrack racing their cars for us you know so it has to stay that way i think and i hope it, and, and everyone everyone realizes that and hopes it does so there so um and you, so you put a pretty hot tune up in you know especially well, qualifying is always you know i need to get down the track need to get in the field kind of thing you know so some guys will go like zaff will go hell for leather every time you don't care well the same as uh, paul moyet you know those two guys going head to head at the moment <laughs> they just uh they don't care they just go as fast as they can every time you know and sometimes it screws up and they don't get in and, and or don't go as fast as they want but uh in general uh yeah so you qualifying's a bit different then when the first round comes in it's just you're on you know first rounds um, always the toughest round. It's the one that you got. You got to win. It's it's easy to, you know. So it's the first round and uh, second round's always, I suppose, very similar. And then if you get to the final, it's all cool then because mm-hmm. you're in the final. You know, if you win or lose, you only, the worst you can do is runner up. Yeah. So uh, but yeah, the cars themselves, you strap yourself in. Obviously, head restraints and that nowadays. Uh, a lot of stuff different to the early days. You know, when you had nothing, mm-hmm. and uh, then we had head. head then we had neck races, and now we've got uh, you know hands devices and stuff like that. And so you do feel a bit better in the car, actually, to tell you the truth, with all that gear on. You know, you know the safety side of it's really working, and it was as good as it can be anyway. So uh, you know, check all the shoots. The boys have checked everything. You go out there and uh, you're up. So they fire the car up, and uh, 
Vern out, nice long Vern out, you know. Well, it all depends on the day. If it's a really hot day and a really hot track, you've got to keep the Vern outs down a little bit worse luck. But if, at Wynn and Ashtills and places like that, uh, it's, uh, yeah, you can do long Vern outs because the track's cold and you've got to get some tyres. They re- do recommend, uh, I think it's uh, five seconds at so many revs, but who cares? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Longer the Vern out, the better. But, uh, yeah, and we love doing I love doing that sort of stuff. But nowadays, with the, the, the cars are so st- the valve springs and compression ratios, it's just so stressed. If you do too big a vein out, so you can just break a blow valve on the head of the throttle. Oh, yeah, there. You know, when you open the throttle, uh, you can just bust the blow valve to snap if you've done too much stupid shit with it. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, and I recently allowed auto shift in. So, we've had to shift gears right up until now. So, and that, and you know, it's not hard once you get used to it. And you, you prefer the old way or? Uh, a lot of it's it's actually very controversial in in this in the within the sport because a lot of guys say it took a lot of the driver away, uh, but you know I used to be able to shift within you know thirty or twenty thirty revs every time and so could Van and so could everyone pretty much you know and uh, everyone gets used to shifting so I don't really know that it made that much difference what it did when newbies come along. Uh, they had trouble with it, you know. What I mean, they, it was very yeah. difficult for someone to get used to shifting their things that quick. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have shift lights and stuff, and but uh, so but yeah, the auto shift just makes it fill proof, you know. What I mean, like you just go down. The first time I went down there with with uh, auto shift, which was uh, in Sydney a couple of meetings ago, I sort of uh, drove the car down the racetrack, and the thing's shifting itself and taking off and shifting itself, and taking off. I'm sort of looking around, going, "This ain't got much to do anymore, is there?" <laughs> Yeah, because you know, you really the shifting something you got to concentrate on because yeah. to get the revs right, to get the car to go fast, but and it just uh, what, there's multi-speed transmissions nowadays with the advent of converters. Like most cars have got converters in them nowadays, and and, and uh, they still have the manual transmission, so you still got to be shifted. But they've got a converter instead of a clutch. Um, they're running four. You know, I run a four-speed now. Um, a lot of guys run five speeds. You know, we're not allowed to, but in the US they run seven speeds, and. Uh, the thing is that uh, years ago, when I first built the the, the car with the uh, with the the Holden chassis in it, we had um, we had four speeds in the cars, you know. And then the progression was, oh look, you know, we've got better clutches, more power, three speed, you know. Some guys even went to two speeds. Well, then we went back to three speeds. Now we're back to four speeds, <laughs> you know. So it's just that's just how the sport goes. It's crazy. You got to put in what, what you need, and that's what and that's what's happened. So we're back at four four and five speeds now. So yeah, the auto shift has made a lot of difference to the way the car goes down the racetrack. It has its advantages and it has its disadvantages. And there's been a couple of accidents caused by the, the auto yeah. shifts. Uh, what happens if the car starts spinning the wheels or shaking the tyres, which happens a lot in drag racing, and it's not pointing down the racetrack anymore? The possibility is it might shift. Okay. You know, and you can't you can lock that out with time, but you can't. It's not foolproof. So the car might be heading for the fence. You shift it. So what we do on a normal run, if the car shakes, you shift it, and it stops shaking and drives off. Okay. So if the car is sitting sideways, aiming for the wall, and it shakes, and then it shifts itself, you don't. You would never shift yourself when yes. it's aiming for the wall. It shifts itself straight into the wall. You know, and, that, and it's a dangerous thing. You do have to learn that you know you can't. If a car's not going dead straight in the track with an auto shift, you can't you can't pedal it or anything like that. You know what I mean? You just got to get off it. Yeah, so the cars they're like they're fast early in the run nowadays. You know, once upon a time, you know, one one oh fives were fast, one one point ones were fast in the sixty foot. Now you got, you know, Moitz running not point nine three, you know. In the States they've got door stands running point eight eight, point eight seven in the sixty foot. So they're doing hundred K at the sixty foot mark, you know. That's like, incredible. It is, it's ridiculous, mm. you know. Man, man, how fast they're going. And then you got uh, you know, with the time they're going, well they're doing I can remember uh Bill Coolen in the United States he turned the door slam of world upside down when he ran 200 mile an hour to the quarter mile. Nothing like that had ever been done, you know. Like it was just, how the hell did he do that fast? Gee, this sport's gone somewhere now. Well, if you don't run 200 mile an hour now to half track, you're not going to win the race. You know, it's just how it is. It's just it's, we're running 200 mile an hour now to half track. So um, some cars run like the turbo cars can run 213 to half track, 214 to half track. And I think Ven's been 206 to half track, you know, so it's just crazy how much, how fast it's coming. A lot of it's technology in the chassis of the cars and, you know, more power, more engine. The torque converter thing's helped a lot, although guys like John Zaffier, who's stuck with clutches because he has so much clutch knowledge and he's, and he's got a, he's always had the very best 
clutch uh, program, you know what I mean? Whatever he's doing in his, in his clutch, he's working super well, always has. And so he, he won't change over to a converter quickly, you know, because he got he's winning now with what he's got. So, uh, but, you know, the clutch thing, a lot of people, we had a clutch program, we had a good clutch program, not as good as his, but we had a good clutch program. Uh, used to work well for us, but the, we found the converters to be a lot better. We, everything we've got is automatic nowadays. Mm-hmm. And even the 57, the old 57 Chevy black one that I drive in the street, it's auto. Everything's auto. And all the, all the, uh, all the guys that still run the clutches and stick with the world, the clutches, all they're saying to us all the time is, yeah, but you know, I can see why you'd go to a converter because it'd be good for hill starts, wouldn't they? Mm-hmm. You know, crap like that. <laughs> smart asses. <laughs> There's a, bun- there's a bunch of jokes getting around about, you know, we, we call it pretty bad from the clutch boys. But, you know, it's good rivalry in the sport, the clutch and the auto. And yeah. So, yeah, as you're going down the racetrack, with a the, with the converter, the, the big difference with the converters is, and leaving the start line, when you've got a clutch in the car, you've got your foot on the clutch, you've got a handbrake, mm-hmm. you're pushing the handbrake hard, and you've got, you got your, you know, one on the clutch, you don't, you don't have no foot rake in the car. So you're revving the thing up, you bring it up to the revs, and you let go of the handbrake a little bit, you ride the clutch just a real little bit so the car moves forward. And then when the uh, when the uh, light turns turns amber amber when it flashes amber, yeah. you got to let go of the rake, flatten it, and drop the clutch. Now swapping feet is important. How you swap feet? If you have the if you get your foot down first before you let your clutch up, and this all happens in a split second, the engine revs come up high, and you're more likely going to blow the tyres off it. So, and the other way around is if you get your foot off the clutch first before you get the throttle down it'll vog the motor down hard at the start line. So some guys are really, really good at it, you know, and experience matters a lot, obviously. Mm-hmm. And swapping feet is is uh, just a really tricky thing you know, in clutch cars. Okay, so that's another thing that, another controversial thing when they let autos in, and Zap's one of the ones that hates them. Mm-hmm. Um, all we do in the automatics nowadays, we just have a, a button, a tra- the converter drive that drives the converter instead of the clutch. It has a trans, it has a big, big brake inside, a pressure brake. So when you're on the start line, you, you just pull in and you push a button on that steering wheel and that locks the transmission and then you just go flat to the floor. As soon as the amber light comes, you just go flat to the floor on the throttle and an electronic two-step holds the engine at whatever preset <laughs> revs you have. And then, so you're sitting there, and all you do is just flick your finger off the button. There is no swap feet. There is no sand. It's perfect every time, you know what I mean? And um, the clutch boys hate it, you know, because yeah. uh, they just say it took – well, you know, guys like Zap, and, you know, because he's so good at what he has, yes. um, he says things like, uh, you know, well, you've taken away the start line. Gary Phillips is the same. Gary Phillips hates converters because he says you're taking away – the fact the swapping of the feet, which is something that he's extremely good at, yeah. you know, and um, I think 21 championships like Gary's got sort of yes. proves the fact he knows yeah. what he's doing in that area. Yeah. And uh, so he uh, yeah, so he just doesn't like the auto, leaving off a button, you know, he said it just gives um, inexperienced guys a major advantage that they wouldn't normally have had. Mm-hmm. And uh, same as the auto shift, you know, he just doesn't, him and Gary and Zaff and all the old fellas just think, you know, you're just taking away the driver. So... But uh, I think the sport's got to move on and, uh, you know, it's got to progress as things go. A lot of the sports now see into turbo cars come along. Mm-hmm. Turbo V8s are just absolutely incredible. Like, uh, I think we'd be lucky to have 3,500 horsepower in one of our engines on the very best day of Lowen. Uh They dynoed a uh, twin turbo Hemi in the United States. Yeah, they had 5,700 horsepower. <laughs> 5,700 horse, and they commonly have 5,200, 5,300, and there wouldn't be one out there that hasn't got 4,000, you know, so uh, they're, they're a whole whole new ball game, that is, and, and they want to get in a race with us. But in the United States, they race blowing cars against turbo cars but uh, and nitrous cars, and the, obviously the problem for the sanctioning body is keeping the parity there. Yeah. Um, and so they've got real small turbos on them and uh, and they limited the boost right so which they can do with turbos and then the nitrous cars have struggled keeping up with anyone so you know it's um, they're allowed to do virtually anything they want to do and pretty much and they do they win races but not as much as the turbo cars and not the Blanca so what it is now in the States because you've got all three in there depending on the weather and the track on the day who's got the advantage basically and uh, you know if it's really good weather the blower cars come good uh, if the weather's crappy the turbo cars come good um, if the track's you know really really crappy the nitrous cars usually come good so that's where they are that's why we've really pushed hard not to get to not to allow the tur- turbo cars and the nitrous guys want to come and race in door slammer mm-hmm. you know but uh, we, no one really wants them in there but now there's so many of them 
that they start a new class called Fro Extreme, which is unlimited everything. So you can do anything you like, uh, which gives the blowing cars a disadvantage because the turbo car, we can't make the horsepower they can make. Mm. And I'd say if they ever put some rules into that Pro Extreme class, it would morph into the two class would morph together, you know. So um, was it driving the, the turbo cars is a whole different ball game again. You have little vomp boxes and stuff, so they, they're pretty much – you know, traction controlled, engine controlled, ECUs, everything is they're completely controlled by computers and um that's then that they have to be, you know. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be totally against turbo cars if they limited the turbo to one because mm-hmm. we only got one lower, they can only have one turbo mm-hmm. and gave them instead of computer control, gave them pop offs, check valves and fills, okay. like we're gonna use. Okay. And then it'd be fair. Mm. Problem is, they wouldn't go very good, mm. <laughs> you know. So they would never agree to that. But I think there's, I think there's enough of them now to have a, to build a class, a strong class of turbo and nitrous cars, and any blowing cars that want to go and fly there. Zap could fly there easy. We, we, we're limited to blowers. Yes. Our blower, we, there's bigger blowers out there than what we're allowed to use, mm. and uh, and you can put more overdrive on them. So it, there's a lot of things happening at the moment, and I think one of the biggest problems is going to be the race tracks to hold the cars mm-hmm. uh, in the raking areas. That's okay. that's the biggest thing facing the promoters and the sanctioning bodies right now in Australian drag racing and probably drag racing in the world is how much raking area you've got to pull off a 20... Because we're heavy. That you need. 2,700-pound yeah. 2, cars. If anything goes wrong, anything goes wrong, you're, you're in a bit of trouble, you know what I mean? If one parachute doesn't come out, and you, like Steve Hand the other day, 257 mile an hour or something, he ran in Sydney, one parachute didn't come out, and he went um, he went like 30 metres into the sand and couldn't do anything about it. He's got four-wheel carbon brakes. Um, and uh, Sam Fennick, a, a couple of a few months ago, neither shoot come out. And he hit the he hit the sand at and the nets at over two hundred and twenty mile an hour, and uh, he's so lucky that you know he had re- had a neck restraint, seat belts, mm-hmm. and he had all the vest stuff. He had one of the vest cars you can buy, mm-hmm. and uh, you know by the time the the other driver got down to see if he was all right to try and help him out of the car, he was standing behind the standing beside the car. You know what I mean? So it's uh, damaged the car and wrecked everything. But you know the nets and so on. That's going to be one of the biggest problems because they don't. There is race tracks that like. Adelaide and and uh, other tracks in the country that don't have the big long raking areas and don't have nets like mm-hmm. in Darwin you can't have a net there because that's a V8 supercar track okay. and I'm sure they're going to want a net sitting in the middle of the racetrack yeah. but um, yeah so that is going, that's the biggest issue facing everyone at the moment is, is how to control that um, you say a lot of people say let's slow the cars down okay so what do you do you make them lighter to make them safer oh hang on they go faster won't they yes. so that's no good Okay, we're going to limit the motors. Well, every time they limit the engines in the United States, they work out how to make them go faster. So, mm-hmm. alcohol funny cars in the States used to run 570s, 580s, and uh, they said they were going too fast, so they, they took overdrive off them. Instead of running 125% over in the blower, they dropped it into 92% over in the blower, and now they're running 540s. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so nearly, at nearly 280 mile an hour. So, you know, it, a crew chief in a drag car will always work out, you know, they up the compression, they up the revs. And uh, you know they just make the cars go fast because you can let the car go fast. That you know is what the, what the basic thing is. So the, I don't think they'll ever get it that way. They've tried putting uh, RPM limits on the cars. Just put a taller diff gear in the car. You know, and you get around that. In NHRA in America, you are limited to diff gear, and that's why they've done it to keep the mile and hours down a bit. You know, um, but I know the sanctioning bodies are talking about it all the time. We're talking about it all the time, especially after Sam Phoenix accident. That was a scary accident. I mean. You know, he got to go home to his family that night, which is just so good. But the accident, when you see, look, Google it up and have a look at it, man, it was just horrific, frightening. horrific, frightening. You know, you're hitting a net at 220 plus mile an hour. You just wouldn't think you had any chance at all, you know. But mm-hmm. um, And uh, the nets did their job, I suppose, but um, they, they wrecked the nets and everything and wrecked the car, but at least he got out walked away. At least it worked. It is heaven to come here, mate, because we're in your workshop as we record the podcast, surrounded by race cars and other bits and pieces give people that are perhaps listening that aren't diehard drag racing fans but are fans of motorsport a sense of what it takes to run a team like this in terms of personnel um you don't have to give us an exact budget but maybe a, a range uh, you know of what's involved i mean it is a it's a big undertaking mate isn't it yeah, it's um, you know, you know, we've got a lot of stuff here, and I've got a big workshop, got a lot of gear, probably more than anyone else's drag racing in the country. But uh, I've been doing it for forty plus years, you know. Um, 
Yeah, Gary Phillips is probably another one that's got a lot of lot of good stuff, and he's just recently upgraded his workshop over where he lives too. So, but we got a massive workshop. Oh, you got to understand that this workshop here, and I spent my whole career knowing that I, I love old cars. I love restoring them. Oh, let's say customising them, acquiring <laughs> so, them, <laughs> yeah, acquiring them and customising them. So, I built as well as the the workshop. Just in a basic overview, my workshop here is probably. Uh, half and half drag racing and the other half is restoration so I've got a panel shop here I've got a carbon fibre shop here I've got a 3D printing shop here a vacuum forms here um, I've got a lot of stuff for manufacturing here hopefully if I get an opportunity after after racing when Venny takes over and I want to that's, that's, what, that's what I've always wanted to do ever since I was a young fella racing I wouldn't say it got in the way because I love doing it mm. but racing like, if I didn't do this I'd be I'd be would have customised two hundred cars by now. You know what I mean? That's just what I would. I really love just doing that stuff. And I got, um, I think it's forty seven cars here at the moment. <laughs> Vix, Cadillacs, Chevys, um, you know, pickup trucks, all sorts of stuff. And some are restored. Some I've bought half restored. Some are customised. And uh, made him on little Mick. He's uh, he's done a bit of work on a couple of them for me. And a few other guys, Dick Langdon's done a little bit of stuff over the years for me. And uh, you know. There's still a lot here that need a lot of work, and I've got a lot of plans. I lay in bed every night working out what I'm going to do, just don't ever get time to do it. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and some of the stuff I want to build, I mean, you know, Street Machine Magazine, the Summer Nats, all that sort of stuff, that's what that's what I really was sort of into. And yeah. drag racing was sort of a side love, a side love, you know what I mean? That uh, it sort of obviously blossomed into what I did for a living. And while I've had good income from, from drag racing, and, uh, you know, me and Marie live, live pretty basically. Um, you know, I've, I've put a lot of stuff aside, bought equipment that's all ready to go, some of the best equipment you can buy in the world for restoration and um, and customisation and stuff, and that's where I want to go. So basically the workshop's half and half. But to run a drag, you need a good engine room. Obviously you need a good engine room. People come here and, and reckon I've got a Lamborghini engine room, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, there is, there is two of us racing the team, and I've got actually four cars here at the moment. I've got... Two friends from New Zealand, Trevor Smith and Rod Harvey. Mm-hmm. They're both based here. And, uh, you know, we do a lot of building engines for ourselves as well for some of the other cars. But uh, so we've got four spots in our engine room. Most people have one. We've got four uh, bays in our engine room. Are you hands-on in the engine room? Um, not so much since the accident, mm-hmm. since the can- cancer, you know. Um, but Vinny's sort of taken over that. He's, mm-hmm. so we had Graham, Graham Frawley working here for a while, and that took a lot of load off us because he, he was an ex- excellent engine builder mm-hmm. and he's someone we could trust, you know, and we could yeah. trust to do the engines. And uh, But he had uh, he left when we had, I think we dropped, lost a sponsor or something, and, mm-hmm. and we had a few months with that, and I couldn't, couldn't pay, you know, and that's mm-hmm. nothing about payrolls and stuff. You've got to keep that rolling along too, you know. So. We've got a, a nice big engine room, good cleaning room out the back, you know, because that's, that's where a lot of it is. It's maintaining the engine. Preventative maintenance is what keeps drag race teams going. It, you know, if, if you try and get that last five runs out of a set of Conrod, you're probably going to blow the motor up. It's going to cost you $50,000. So you're better off putting a $2,000 set of Conrods in, mm. you know, and having a program that will com- complete, you know, puts them in at, at a specific yeah. time that you, like 22 runs, we say we replace our Conrods, okay. right? We had, when we had didn't have some cash there a few years ago when Vin was running a funny car as well, uh, we did 47 runs on a set of Conrods with no problem. Mm. So you probably could do that. Mm. But then I've also seen them break at 10. Yeah, okay. So, you know, 22 and we just take the risk at 22. And uh, valve springs, valves, we do 50 runs on the valves. Uh, crankshafts usually crack before you get to your 50 runs, you know. Um, you know, if you have trauma and you break a lock and stuff like that, you know, valve, spring, valve springs last... Bell Springs used to last about 10 runs once or less uh, with the technology. Noonan, um, Jamie Noonan, uh, Noonan Race Engineering, uh, he now, he's in the States now, but when he was here he had a Sprintron. So you could put your engine and your head onto a, a, a Sprintron mm. that would spin it up and that way, and he had it all... Uh, um, radar and stuff watching the valve open and shutting the valve spring and you could see it on a graph what was going on and while we had that we developed um, technology we did it Zap did it and a few other guys did it individually not not together um, and we all developed camshafts camshaft profiles that are a lot softer once you see it in front of you simple you know and Jamie had that thing going and we all went over there we did about 100 hours on it and I know Zap did a lot on it, and a lot of other teams did a lot, and Jamie did a lot on it too, you know. And you learn an awful lot. So now, you know, touch wood, uh, we can get 60, 70 runs out of Wells Springs, you know what I mean? It just changes because the, 
the uh, and you can still break one on the first run. Don't get me wrong. You know, there's still there's still issues with manufacturing stuff that still go on. But um, yeah, so a lot of stuff, a lot has changed. A lot of stuff. The magneto is a lot better nowadays than it used to be as well. So, so in the workshop, and then we've got an assembly area for the cars. It holds three cars. Then then allows me to have one bay, which is really good of him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he's got his his door slammer in one bay, and then he's got uh, his turbo Toyota Solara in the in the next bay. And then Rod Harvey's got a, he's got another vade to himself, and so has Trev Smith got a vade to themselves. And then uh, Ven's also got a um, another street car that he races, uh, a Datsun. Yeah, Dad Ven's a bit of a Datsun. You walk in this sixteen hundred, I think, is it? Yeah, I think so. You walk in the workshop. There you go. Hang on, fifty seven Chev Cor- <laughs> Cor- Cor- Corvette. Whose is this Datsun? Corvette. What are them Datsuns <laughs> doing over there? And uh, yeah, that's just Venny loves them. He's, he's got one that he races. And he's also in the middle of building a radial car. So drag racing's um, spearing out a little bit in a couple of areas in Australia, or in the world actually. One of the you know, we got big fat tyres in the back of our car, and they got bigger and bigger over the years. And we've learned how to use them. And uh, some guys got sick of that, didn't like it. Think you know they used to they bought a class in called Ten Five Racing, where they used to have a tyre ten point five inches wide. And they started going real fast and that. So now they use these little piss ass little radials on the back of cars, <laughs> and they and they and they, they they run the door slam of type engines in them, big twin turbo V eights and blowing supercharged screw blowing engines with three and four thousand. You know, and they get these things and they've learnt they've learnt by um, changing the suspension in the car and they change it radically. And they change the suspension and the and the way they run the clutch and the timing and all that in the car. Those cars nowadays, a radial car, even though a bit lighter, a radial car with a, I think they have three hundred and sixty five mil tire on the back of them, um, will go faster and quicker than a door slammer. No way. Yeah, the tracks have to be a lot better, yeah. right? The tracks have to be prepped in a certain way. Mm-hmm. But they've got a now going. You know, I think the the vest now is a three. Five eight to half track. Well, I don't think any blind door slam has gone that fast. That is nuts. It is, and it's just because they they were given here's your parameters, right? Mm. This is what you got. This is the tire you got. Mm. You guys work out how to go fast. And they started off not being very good at it, and because they were, they were ch- they were while they were experimenting with their while they were experimenting with their suspensions to put more load on the back tire, mm. and they were changing it in ways that they were just trying you know, experimenting with stuff they'd get down the half track and the thing would blow over backwards you know it'd be doing a big wheel stand some guys are doing wheel stand the whole way down the track and it was just dangerous mm-hmm. but nowadays they got them just going Toom! straight down the racetrack so it just goes to show the big tyre yes it, it works on a much more variety of racetracks mm-hmm. but these radial guys just different branches in drag racing now that are sort of taken off and stuff that I never thought would ever, ever, ever happen. I, I love the the constant quest, mate, the fact that we'll get to a little bit of the, the key ones in, in a minute, the mm. constant quest to, you know, set specific times or to break certain barriers. I think that, mm. that's remarkable. You are the undisputed godfather of door slammer, mate. Uh, you, some of the stuff you've done changed blown sedan racing in this, in this country and globally for that matter. You know, the... The records you've achieved. Let's deal with the the six titles here, which I think is remarkable. Is there one that's special to you, and and why? Um, it was nineteen ninety six is the one that's for sure. There's no doubt about that. It was the first one, I think. And um, it, the reason was because that year, and on the the ninth of the sixth in nineteen ninety six, um, I became the world's fastest door slammer. I was the quickest and fastest door slammer. It was recognised in the United States too. What did you do at the time? Tell people. Uh, the, time? Yeah, the time. It was six twenty nine at two hundred and twenty five mile an hour. Street Machine actually put out a video on it, so there you go. It was uh, it was a good thing, and uh, it made me feel good. I, I it just after all the work and all, everything that we had done, Murray Anderson, his input with the race car, and uh, you know the, the fact that I had, I had Greg Gow help me with the tune up at the time, who who had recently ran the first five second run, you know, in a funny car, and. Uh, it was just a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of input from a lot of people. And then uh, Norm Drazer, who invented the VSI Supercharger, he actually was over here. And, um, you know, we had the car running what I considered pretty good. It was running, and no one had run a, a 620. No one in the world had run a 620 at that time. We had 629, 225, and the mile an hour was high. And then it was around about the time, that's when my, my big um, shit fight started with Peter Gratz. Um, Peter Gratz was another great racer from over here in Queensland. He had, me and him had a hell of a rivalry, you know, going for a long, long time. And 
he actually, I ran just a mile on our side of it. I went 229.22 or something, and he went 229.40 or something like that. And then I went 229.70, and he went 229.80 something. And then I went 229.90 something. I thought, you're gone, void. Next run, he went 230. What a bastard. <laughs> and uh, But, yeah, you know, things like that, that's what makes the sport interesting. It still does today. You know, guys like, you know, Paul Moet the other day went 558 um, racing in Sydney. Wow, you know, 558 in, in, a, in, a, in a sedan that weighs 2,700 tons. It's crazy. We would never have thought it would have happened. But I would, I would never say that we won't see a four-second door slammer one day. I might not see one, but, you know, I'd, I'd say they're going to see a four-second door slammer one day. No doubt about it. And... Um, yeah, it's just amazing. Those turbo cars, a twin turbo car made light enough now would probably um, run closer than anything else we got at the moment. So we'll see. I'd like to see one. That's the end of part one of my chat with Victor Bray. To continue listening, head across to part two where we talk about the rivalries, the next generation. He opens up on the seriousness of the cancer scare getting back to his beloved drag racing. Listener.